This is Morecambe Bay, where the production platforms of the gas field are now as much a feature of Northwest England as Blackpool Tower and the Illuminations. This is big business. 5,000 billion cubic feet of gas down there and a 1.3 billion pound investment to get at it. And that's only phase one. Four years ago, I walked along the shore of this bay, picking my way carefully through the history and achievements of the gas industry. And the film that was shot then has, I understand, been seen by many people. It's even won a prize or two, including a CBI award for the film which best demonstrated success in British industry. But the gas industry has gone much further since then, and therefore I would like to show you some of that film again, with a few changes to bring it up to date, and then add a word or two. For centuries, men have crossed the shifting sands to harvest the shrimps. But beneath the sands were greater riches. British gas explored these depths and found a gas field, a field big enough, wisely used, to help meet the winter's peak demand for 30 years and more. Gas was the image of the urban childhood. When every town had its own gas works, the rise and fall of the gas holder was the barometer of the town's activities. On Sunday lunchtime, men used to sit on the gas holder to force the maximum pressure into the local mains. It was a sooty, smutty, smelly world of fizzing mantles and yellow light. But when the mantle gave way to the bulb and the gas ring to the hot plate, men began to talk of the all-electric house. Gas, it seemed, had had its day. When gas was nationalized after the war, a thousand municipal and private gas light and coke companies with a thousand gas works became one. But it took time. The thousand had each fed their own gas into their own mains at low pressure. Step by step, the older, smaller works were closed until the nation's gas came from fewer than 200 gas works. But that was... For more than a century, gas had been made by carbonizing high-grade coal to produce not only gas, but coke and tar as well. And they had to be sold separately. Now it was to be made by gasifying low-grade coal to produce gas alone and some residual ash. That was a revolution in itself, and two coal gasification plants were built, one in the Midlands and one in Scotland. But it was not revolutionary enough. Oil was by now the world's favorite fuel, cheap and plentiful, and Britain led the world in turning oil into gas and pushing it at high pressure through local networks and into the mains. pushing it, too, into the mainstream of public consciousness. This was the beginning of the era of high-speed gas. People who move with today's high-speed world use high-speed gas. Of the advertising that alerted consumers to the virtues of gas. It's such fun to cook so many wonderful dishes with high-speed gas heat that obeys you. Of the slogans that spoke of the instant fuel, clean, immediate, controlled. There was a new confidence in the industry, and the consumers responded, first in the home, and then in the factory. It's one big lazing, eating, bathing, basking world, when you make the most of high-speed gas. Meanwhile, the gas industry had made another breakthrough. It was importing gas, natural gas, from Algeria. No one had done it before, 
They had burned natural gas, but never shipped it across the seas. Perhaps they thought the ships would float away skywards. But the natural gas was liquefied. Every 600 cubic feet of gas reduced to one cubic foot of liquid, and then transported to Britain and stored ashore. Soon, eight of the 12 regions of British gas were linked to a methane grid. Those two great engineering achievements, the high-pressure gasification of imported oil and the importation of liquid natural gas, transformed the gas industry. They were accompanied by modern marketing methods and the development of new gas appliances. Sales of gas fires alone went up from around 100,000 a year to nearly a million a year. And people no longer spoke of the gas industry as outdated, but as up-to-date. An industry not of the past, but of the present and of the future. And they were right. The industry certainly had a present and a future. But not by gasifying oil, nor even by importing liquefied natural gas. No, by piping it ashore. The discovery of gas in the North Sea set the nation alight. Offshore, the technology got all the publicity. Onshore came the great conversion. Not since St. Augustine set foot on the Isle of Thanet were so many people converted by so few in such a short time. And stories abounded. My favourite is of the woman who complained that her food tasted different, cooked by North Sea gas. She wasn't adding salt. She thought that the gas would be salty enough. The truth is that 13 million homes were converted in 10 years, with the minimum of fuss and within a budget. It was, somebody said, perhaps the greatest peacetime operation in the nation's history. And that was only the half of it. What happened in the back kitchens of Britain was as nothing compared with what was going on underground. The building of the national transmission system for natural gas is an engineering feat of which Brunel himself would have been proud. It can be compared with the spread of the railways in Victorian times. But there is one big difference. Scarcely anyone knew that it was happening. I often wonder how they thought the gas got from the North Sea to their homes. The underground system, which is still being extended, is a national high-pressure network of 3,300 miles of steel pipeline. In turn, this network feeds regional medium and low-pressure mains over 40 times longer again. Farmers agreed to have the pipes laid across their land, knowing that they would be out of sight and leave no scar. But the gas needs a push. At strategic locations along most of the high-pressure pipelines, compressor stations boost the flow of gas. They too are run on gas and powered by industrial versions of Rolls-Royce aero engines. But compressors are noisy and nobody likes a noisy neighbour, so the stations are soundproofed. Close the doors and you keep the noise within. Noise suppression is only one of many things British gas engineers are good at. Their research and development is an extensive, intensive, continuous program and very ingenious. They look at every aspect of the gas business. They'll show you how a gas reservoir, offshore and unseeable, is likely to behave throughout its life. They're always improving their own technology of controlling the movement of gas around the country with devices ever smaller, subtler and subterranean. They will tell you if a new appliance is safe enough to be welcomed into the home. They have developed gas-driven heat pumps which baffle the mind by creating more heat than they use. They invented this, the intelligent pig, bristling with electronics, but propelled by gas. It can inspect the high-pressure pipelines inside and out. 
while a sophisticated data analysis system computes a way to ensure that whatever the pig sniffs out is correctly assessed. The intelligent pig is typical of the inventions of British gas. It solves a problem at home and the service sells well abroad. Offshore gas comes on shore at five terminals around our coast. This one is the biggest and as smart an emblem as any of the technology of gas. It handles 4,000 million cubic feet of gas a day. And that's four times as much as the whole country consumed before there was North Sea gas. One man controls the flow of all this gas. To make as much from coal in the old way would require the efforts of thousands of men. At each of the five onshore terminals, they make sure that the gas is up to specification, blend it and then meter it. They also add the smell. Natural gas has no smell, but they make it smell like town gas for safety. Then off it is piped around the network. Unseen, no pylons, no coal trains, no tankers cluttering the roads. And when they burn it, there is no smoke, no grit, no ash. Nothing to upset the environment. The industry makes great store of that. And in summertime, when there's more than enough gas, they make great store of storing it. They liquefy it and put it in tanks, each of which holds what was a day's supply for the whole country in the days before offshore gas. They bury it a mile and more beneath the ground in salt cavities at Hornsea on Humberside. A cavity is created by dissolving some of the salt in water. Gas is then compressed into vacant space and stored at pressures greater than those in the transmission system. So when it is needed, it can simply be turned on. And off the coast of Humberside, the partly depleted rough field has been converted by British Gas into a huge gas store. This is the first time an offshore reservoir has been converted for this purpose. Through the normal transmission system, gas from other fields in the North Sea is pumped into rough in the summer to be drawn off in the winter. The rough field used to produce 150 million cubic feet of gas a day. Now a store, it will provide up to 1,000 million cubic feet a day. This in an industry whose peak output can reach 9,000 million cubic feet a day. Which brings me back to Morecambe Bay, Britain's newest natural gas field and the source of future winter war. Stop. I haven't finished yet. That was four years ago. I hadn't finished then and I haven't finished now and I probably never shall finish because this is a story without an end about an industry which never stops. They have over 16 million customers. That's a million more than four years ago. 11 million homes cooked by gas. Over 10 million have gas fires and over 9 million have central heating. British Gas is Britain's largest supplier of heat to domestic users and it provides a third of the fuel for factories and commercial premises. In offices, it warms the working space, heats the water, cooks the lunch. In industry, it can slice through an ingot or treat finished components to a surface sheen and a quality of infinite variety. The industrialist, like the housewife, knows that gas is clean and controllable. Wherever he needs purity, delicacy and precision, he needs gas at his fingertips. When you see engineers replacing older pipes with the new yellow polyethylene ones, it's all part of the continuing program to ensure the safety of the network. They spend hundreds of millions of pounds a year doing it. And the new techniques and technology used to replace old mains and install new ones have helped bring down the cost of connecting up new customers. 
helping British Gas to expand its business. Wherever and whenever the gas man is called, the gas man cometh. And remember that he gets 15 million service calls a year. And there are 14,000 different spare parts that you might need. That's just one of the reasons why British Gas has an extensive and sophisticated computer capability. For this is an industry that uses high technology as much in its offices as in the offshore gas fields. It has to with around 80 million gas bills a year. The people in British Gas, and there are nearly 90,000 of them, have long been preaching, in every sense, to the converted. That's why British Gas is one of the top 10 businesses in Britain. It is always there at the turn of a tap, in winter and summer alike. That is what the customer expects, and that is what he gets. He also gets advice because gas is too good to waste. So British Gas offers generous advice and helps to develop parsimonious appliances. It invests a lot of time and money helping customers to use gas efficiently, like importing natural gas, or even making some more, not by the old methods, but by new. Substitute natural gas, SNG and they are at it already. They have developed processes to make SNG from coal and from heavy oil. They have even put some SNG into the network. No one knew, because no one can tell the difference. They know what they are doing. Energy, as they are fond of saying, is their business, and theirs is an industry for the future. There will be gas this century and next, rest assured. There will be gas bills too, 